Well, that's it. Christmas is over. I hope your Christmas was full of love and merriment and good cheer. As we've worked through the uh, Gospel of Luke during this Advent season, there has certainly been plenty of glad tidings of great joy. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing in your sight. As we say goodbye to Luke for a while, it's worth taking a moment to appreciate how uniquely he has shared with us what we might call the Christmas story. Matthew zeroed in on how Jesus as Joseph's son is in the line of David. Then he tells us about Joseph's decision not to quietly divorce Mary after having an angelic vision. He tells of the visit of the Magi, back to Joseph, having another vision to escape to Egypt. Sometime within the next two years, there is the murderous rampage of Herod. And finally, Matthew's Joseph has a vision to return to Nazareth after Herod's death. Matthew very much is focused on Jesus' birth from the perspective of Joseph, a son of David. Mark, the gospel most noted for being thrifty with words, skips over the Christmas story altogether. John, from a lofty theological perspective, just brushes up against it briefly. The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. We have seen His glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Now the Apostle Paul tells the story as almost an aside when he describes Jesus as, quote, born of a woman born under law, unquote, which seems like a short shrift compared to Luke's much more detailed account of Jesus' birth, which was primarily from the perspective of Mary and Jesus. Paul's first phrase, born of a woman, could be compared to what Luke wrote beginning in verse 1 all the way up through the 40th verse of chapter 2. And his second verse, born under law, could be compared, and Paul's second verse, could be compared to today's reading in Luke. And all of these readings from Luke are unique to the Gospel of Luke. In this week's reading, Luke chapter 2, verses 22 through 40, there are four explicit statements that Jesus' parents did what was required by Jewish law. To do this, they went to Jerusalem, which is mentioned six times in this chapter. Arriving at the temple, old man Simeon was waiting for the consolation of Israel. In this context, consolation means not just the comfort of being called alongside God, but also the one who was to come and bring that consolation to Israel. Simeon raises his arms and praises God, saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace. Simeon's peace may be a nod to the peace declared by the angels in Luke chapter 2, verse 14. Simeon also affirms that this peace is for both Jews and Gentiles. That's a thread of truth that runs from the Abrahamic covenant in Genesis through Isaiah, and on through Luke's Gospel and into Acts. Now, as Luke points out, Simeon directs his next comments to Mary. He predicts that Jesus will, quote, cause the falling and rising of many in Israel, unquote. The falling and rising isn't referring to the rise of Israel and the fall of Rome, although there were a lot of people hoping that's what was meant. Uh, Jesus' arrival on earth pivots from that understanding. It's the falling of those who, whose trust is not in God and the rise of those who receive the consolation and the peace of Christ. Simeon now modulates the entirely positive prophecies to this point. He prophesies that Jesus will be a sign that will be spoken against so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed and a sword will pierce your own soul too, directing that last bit to Mary. Of course, Jesus will again affirm the reality of bearing his cross as his time on earth is closing. The path for himself and his followers will always include suffering. 
Whenever God's kingdom of justice and mercy breaks into our world, those who are in established positions of power, privilege, and prestige will join forces with the powers of darkness and rise up in resistance. Our Christian hope is that when Messiah returns for his people, that conflict will end. Justice and mercy will win. God's love will win. But until then, like Mary, a sword may pierce our souls. But we each carry our cross knowing our hope is established in Christ, God incarnate who lived, was crucified, dead and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven. Once again, the Bible takes us from the Christmas movie version of life to what life is really like. We may suffer if we stand up against injustices and the oppressors who continue to perpetrate injustice. There is a price we pay to serve those who are less fortunate than ourselves. It may hurt to love when we don't seem to receive anything in return. But even now, in these between times, there is no greater joy or satisfaction in life than standing with Jesus and his kingdom in our fallen world. It's been said that if you're not part of the solution, you're part of the problem. And being part of the problem? Well, that is as bad a path as we could choose. The Bible tells us to fix our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. So, as we stand on the cusp of the new year, let us, like Jesus, look to the joy that is our hope and continue Jesus' ministry of bringing love justice, and mercy into our world. If you can't have a happy new year, have a joyful new year.